um, let's get back to what we were talking about last week. Uh, so this is uh, so now we're starting the, this week's stuff, and, and we already started it last time. We solved the tangent problem, we solved the tangent problem for this particular function, and the way that we did it was by applying the limit to the slopes of the secant function. So I I'm trying to find the slope of this tangent line here, uh, but I don't have enough information. In particular, I need the slope. So I draw a secant line through some point, a short distance away from the point of tangency. And uh, where's my picture? Yeah, here's my little picture. Right, here's my secant line right here. Here's my tangent line, that two slope I'm trying to find. I started a point, slight distance away, starting here, point two. And I let the, uh, let the point approach the point of tangency. And as I do that, you can see the secant line starts to orient itself in the direction of the tangent line. The closer I get to the tangent line, the more and more those slopes come together. And if I could actually complete this process and force those two points to collapse, I would actually have the slope itself. But in this case, it's going to be undefined under the limit process. I mean, I, as an evaluation, that's undefined because it's indeterminate. Uh, but the limit process, that does exist. And so that's the way that we solve the tangent problem. Um, and that led us to a formulation for this idea, uh, this formulation right here. Um, here's the solution to the tangent problem uh, where the secants, uh, the slope of the secant function is given in this form and the limit applied to that form is the actual slope of the tangent line. And in this model, A represents the point of tangency, H represents some distance between the point of tangency and the sec second point of the secant line. And I let H go to zero. As H goes to zero, that point approaches the tangent point. The, or the, uh, tan the uh, slope of the secant line orients itself more and more in the direction of the tangent line. And the closer I get, the closer those two values come together. And at that point, we could actually solve this algebraically. Right, we showed that once we've got this formula in place and understand how this represents a solution to the tangent problem, uh, now we can actually apply uh, g algebraic methods to determining uh, the slopes of the tangent lines for these different types of functions. Um, and we did a few of those. Um, okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's important because uh, now uh, we're going to introduce uh, the first fundamental operation in calculus built on the limit and it's called the derivative. We're going to give it a name now and it's nothing but that formula that we uh, just determined using the solution to the tangent problem. Here it is. The only difference is we've now we've replaced the point A with the variable X and we've given it a new name. I don't call this M tan anymore. I'm going to call it F prime. So here's a new name for this operation uh, and again this is done uh, in variable form. I'm not using a real number now, I'm using the variable. The derivative now represents a new function. Starting with the function f, its derivative computed through this process is a brand new function. This is the foundation of calculus. Uh, it's built on the back of the limit. Everything that else we do in calculus follows from the derivative and its properties. Uh, we're going to introduce one more operation toward the end, integration, which is uh, an inverse operation with respect to the derivative. Everything in calculus breaks down to how the derivative behaves and its various properties. Um, so this is what we call this prime notation, right? This thing here, this is called prime notation. We pronounce this F prime. Um, but there are other formulations or other notations used to represent the derivative. Um, uh, our prime notation either to the function form or to the variable. Right, y and f, y and f of x are the same thing. f prime of x, y of x, uh, y prime, same thing. They're both forms for the derivative. Uh, and here's probably the most important. This is the one that um, probably is the most common or the most convenient way to represent this. Uh, this is differential notation. We're going to see this a lot. Uh, because in a lot of contexts, it's a more convenient format. It's called differential notation, uh, dy over dx, dy dx, whatever you want to call it. And again, we can repl actually replace y with f. So df over dx, d over dx, applied to f of x. Right? All of these things say the same thing. In particular, this, this says take the derivative of f. 
That's what this set of this this notation represents. That instruction. Take the derivative of f. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, let me go back real quick. Uh, you know, uh, this differential notation actually comes from our solution to the tangent problem. Um, when I look at the diagram that I had here that we used to define this, um, uh, I see this little triangle here. This little triangle that's measuring the slope of the secant line. Uh, rise over run, right? The rise of this is going to be referred to as delta y. That's the change in y values as I move from point to point. And what we used to call the run is represented by delta x, which is the uh, change in the x values as I move from point to point. And in that sense, this, um, this formula here, right, the numerator represents the change in y. That would be delta y. And this guy on bottom, the change in x, h represents the difference between x and the, the x position, the x, x coordinates of the two points. So a lot of times that ratio is represented as the limit of, uh, of, delta, of delta x over delta y. And then when I apply the limit to this, so that would mean that this, uh, this formula here would end up being uh, delta y over delta x. And uh, we represent the outcome of that process dy dx. So that's where that differential notation comes from. It comes from the geometric model where the uh, change in x and change in y represent the ratio that we use to determine those slopes that we're using to estimate tangent line. Okay, so, uh, so there's all that stuff. Uh, all the, uh, the definition of what the uh, derivative is and all the different notations that we use to express the derivative. Okay, so let's actually do it. Let's compute the derivative for a particular function. And then we can use that to find the slope of a tangent line at a particular point. One thing that we always got to keep in mind is that the derivative is the solution to the tangent problem. Every derivative of a function is a response to questions about tangent lines. Okay, so let's do this. Um, here's our function f of x. What is f prime? And in fact, I think we've already done this when we solve the tangent problem. F prime of x is the limit as h approaches zero of this formula. Okay. So what is f of x plus h? The x plus h takes the place of x in the original formula. So 2 times x plus h plus 1. So there's that piece of it. And then from that, I'm going to subtract f of x. There's that piece of it. And when I'm done, all of this is going to be divided by h. And I'll take the limit. And once again, as I said last time, this is always in determinate form. No matter what function you're using, this formula, always indeterminate. Um, so now we go through the process of simplifying this expression. And in this case, that's pretty obvious. Uh, I distribute, combine like terms, we'll see what happens here. Uh, 2x plus 2h plus 1 minus 2x minus 1. So there's the distribution, the elimination of the parentheses. And what's going to happen? Cancel cancel. What do I have left? And what is this limit going to end up being equal to? All right, cancel. What's this equal? No, <laughs> you know, now that I think about it, in fact, this is this problem we solved earlier. In fact, this is the exact same problem. You know, now that I think about it, this question is not all that interesting anymore. <coughs> right? I think the derivative was enough. Uh, we don't really need to ask this question because we already mentioned the fact that for a linear function, the tangent line is the line itself at any point. So, in fact, what I've shown here, please notice that this did not depend on the value of x. In the end, this uh, function, this derivative, ended up being constant. 
um, you know, I start with a function of x. I use the variable x in the expression of the uh, formula, but in the end, all those x's canceled away. This value does not depend on x. It's constant. And again, that's just a reflection of the fact that every linear function is its own tangent line. And so we have shown something important here. Right? What feature of the line does this number two represent? Slope. Yep. So the derivative of a linear function is the slope. And so we just, uh, this is a special case. It's not hard to see. This is the way it's always going to work out. For any linear function, the derivative is the slope. And uh, by the way, I know some of you guys probably already know there's some shortcut rules, rules for derivatives that can be used to avoid going through this process um, uh, in the homework, on the test, on the quiz. You can't use the shortcut rules. The definition has to be used. Okay, same thing here. Yeah, this is more interesting. Yeah. Okay, here's a function, square function. What's the derivative? What is the derivative? Can somebody tell me? 2x, Two X, right? Because there's a shortcut rule. You, know, you already know it. There's a rule here about how that behaves. I don't want you to just tell me it's 2x because you know the rule. I want you to show me from the definition why is the derivative of this function equal to 2x. So y prime can be found by applying the definition. And this is the definition. Okay, so what do I get here? f of x plus h all I do is I replace x with x plus h. So x is being squared in the original formula, so now I'm going to square x plus h. And then I'm going to subtract f of x itself. f of x was just x squared. And then um, all over h. And now what is the square of x plus h? What is it? What's the square of x plus h? Okay, x squared. Oh, come on, come on. Okay, so this is a foil problem though, right? And in fact, I think we saw something very similar to this when we were solving the same problem in the last class. Uh, this is uh, an example of the um, I have a FOIL problem, right? X plus H squared is the square of a binomial, so I actually have to multiply these things together. I'm not going to get in, uh, okay. Everything's all locked up here. Perfect. All right, it's a good time for a break. Great, perfect. So, now I got 420 here. So, now we're going to take our break and come back. Maybe this thing will be cooperating with me. This is the second time this has happened this week. All right, so um, 430, 430, come back. Pro. I'm thinking of it. I haven't tried it yet. I was, you know, the, the first generation tablets just would work. They're just weren't powerful enough. Well, they're about to do four Surface Pro four. That may but be. Uh, I haven't tried it yet. But it looks like it might be the answer. Or you, could, you know, they just announced today the iPad Pro that has a. Pen yeah, pen. I saw that was announced today with the oh. stylus. Um, okay, so let's finish this now. All right, so there's the uh, definition applied to the particular function. So now the only thing is to work out the details. Uh, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. That's the square of the binomial. So make sure you understand where that comes from. 
minus x squared, that's the original function being subtracted, all over h, and once again we get the usual sort of cancellation that I would expect. And if I've done this right, the only thing that should be left should be all terms that involve factors of h. If you still have a term left over that doesn't involve a factor of h, then something's gone wrong. Because what has to happen uh, is for um, that denominator to be canceled away. So once I've performed all the given operations, 2xh plus h squared is all I have on top. And now that zero in the denominator can now be canceled away. Here, here, and one factor of h from the square. And finally, I'm down to this. So, what does the limit equal? 2x. At this point, I can do the direct substitution. Okay, so somebody told me that's exactly what was going to happen. There it is, 2x. Um, but again, uh, on the test and the homework, I'll be explicit. Use the definition. If I say use the definition, uh, that's what this is. This is the definition of the derivative, and that's how we prove that the derivative of the square is 2x. Okay, now, now that we've done that, uh, now we can solve a more general problem. Uh, now I can pick any point on the graph. We solved this problem for x equals 1. Uh, now I can solve this problem for any point on the graph using the formula. So if I want to find the slope of the tangent line at the point where x is equal to 3, how do I do it? Plug it in. The tangent line at the point 3 is now going to have a slope that can be evaluated through the function. f prime of 3 represents the slope of the tangent line at the point where x is 3. So f prime of 3, 2 times 3, 6. Um, let's go ahead and, well, uh, let's go ahead and finish. Let's, let's get the equation, right? There's the slope. That's really the, uh, the, 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 the missing piece. The rest of it should be pretty straightforward. So let's see if we can find the equation of the tangent line from here. Okay, so the slope is 6. And what point do I have to refer to? What is the actual point of tangency going to be? So x is 3, so y is 3 squared. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, I'll go ahead and use point slope form. I can't remember if this is the way I did it last time, but however you want to do it, it's fine. Uh, y minus the y coordinate, the slope 6 times x minus the x coordinate. So, um, And finally, add 9 to both sides. So. so there's the slope. There is the actual tangent line to the equation. Uh, but we saved a lot of time because, we did, and now I can generalize this for any point. Right? It's not, now I'm not just restricted to the point 3 or the point 1 like I was in the initial problem. Uh, but having the uh, derivative as a formula allows me to compute uh, slopes of tangent lines for any arbitrary point whatever for this function, whatever the point is, the slope will be double the x coordinate. Okay. Square root function. What's the derivative of the square root function? Anybody know? Anybody tell me? There's a rule, a shortcut rule for this. If don't know it, then I guess we'll have to do it by the definition. So I'm going to repeat the definition one more time. And now we're using our differential notation, so dy dx. Um, so uh, once again, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And of course, uh, I haven't actually identified f of x. I haven't used that in the notation here. But of course, uh, it's understood that y and f of x identify the same thing. So it doesn't really matter whether I present the function in function form or not. So, uh, 
So f of x plus h is going to be what? Square root of x plus h. So the x gets replaced by x plus h, all sitting on the radical. Minus the square root of x. Um, all over h. Okay, so there we go. There's the um, there's the uh, definition substitution being applied directly. I end up here. Uh, but now the question is, uh, what next? How do I proceed from this point? In the last case, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious. Uh, I had a couple of uh, I had the binomial that I could expand and. After I'd done that, the combining like terms took me to the point where I could actually cancel away that denominator, and that's always the goal. Every one of these problems, the goal is to get down to the point where the denominator, or at least that uh, h factor in the denominator, can be canceled away because that's what's preventing this limit from finishing. But right now, um, uh, it's not clear what I could do as far as manipulating this geometrically so that I can, or algebraically, so that I can make that identification. What's the trick? We need to use conjugate. I think we did that a couple weeks ago. Right. Uh, any expression involves a sum or difference of uh, square roots in particular. This only works for square roots, by the way. It doesn't work for higher powered roots. Uh, but for square roots, uh, any expression that involves a sum or difference can be uh, cleared, uh, the radicals can be cleared using the conjugate operator. And since we have a fraction to work with, I can apply the same uh, expression in both parts and uh, get those radicals in the numerator canceled away, transpose them down into the denominator, and hopefully that will uh, actually be something that's helpful. So in the numerator, the sum now of the radicals instead of the difference. And since that's what I need in the numerator to cancel those radicals away, I've got to repeat that in the denominator. Uh, so again, this is an old trick, but now what happens? But well, now in the denominator, there's really not much going on. I've got an extra factor now, so as far as the denominator goes, I've got that h that was there to begin with, and then I've got this new factor that um, uh, came out of the, what I hope is going to be clearing of the radicals in the numerator and what I have left in the numerator. What's the point of using these conjugates? How does that help me? Yeah, it's a difference of squares. So what I end up with here is the square, uh, in fact, let me go ahead and I'm going to make this explicit. What I end up with here is uh, the square of the first term minus the square of the second term. That's why, you know, alternating the sign here that's where the difference of squares come from. So the square of the first minus the square of the second, uh, what would have been those terms in the middle through the FOIL method cancel each other away because they're plus and minus of each other. And that's how, and now the square of the square root, that's where the cancellation comes from. In each one of these cases, the square cancels the square root. And uh, now I can see uh, why that was so helpful. What do I have left in the numerator now? What do I have left in the numerator now? H. That's what I needed, right? Now I've isolated the factor of H in the numerator, and that now can be used to cancel that factor of H from the denominator. And that will now allow the limit to be completed. Uh, what's left over in the numerator? One. So that's multiplicative cancellation and the denominator. I've got this. Finally, what's the value of the limit? Now I can replace h with zero. No problem now. That does not result in a denominator that is uh, forced to zero. 
Well, in fact, I don't need the limit anymore. I'm about to do the direct substitution. So what do I end up with here? So replacing h with 0, the first term, x plus h, x. And finally, simplest form of this. 1 over what? 2 squared of x. Square root of x plus the square root of x, that's two of those. Right? That's addition. So there it is. There's a derivative of the square root function. Um, again, at this point, uh, unless you've seen, uh, now, you know, if you've seen the, the shortcuts, if you've seen the, the rules for derivatives that we're going to learn after the first test, then you could have anticipated that this is going to be the result. Uh, why it works out this way, uh, you know, in, in particular, if we compare that to the previous case, uh, x squared becoming, the derivative of x squared becoming 2x. Um, does that give us any hints about how this is going to work? We'll solve that problem next time, or next week, no, after the test, but. Um, and finally, uh, let's do one more. And here's, so we did the square, well, we did the linear function. We start with the linear function. And from what we did here, the conclusion is that the derivative of every linear function is its slope. We did the square root function, uh, the square function, and we got 2x. We did the square root function, we got 1 over twice root x. And now let's do the reciprocal function. What's the derivative of the reciprocal function? Okay. So these are all, uh, you know, several of our fundamental functional forms. Powers, radicals, reciprocals. So h is approaching zero. Uh, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Ah, I'll just go ahead and do the substitutions. What is f of x plus h going to be? And I think, and in fact, we've done this problem already. It's just that when we did this problem last week, uh, we had a number in place of x instead of a variable. But, so it's going to work out the same way. Um, uh, so f of x plus h, I just replace x with x plus h, push the whole thing in the denominator. f of x itself, the reciprocal. Uh, and once again, at least at this point, it's unclear how to proceed. Um, well, I guess there's a couple of things we could do. What's the trick that we learned last week? Common denominator. So I look at the two. So this is the compound fraction problem. I've got a fraction, fractional values within a fraction. So uh, the typical, uh, in fact, even if I wasn't uh, in the middle of the limit process here, the, the proper thing to do is clear the fractions. Uh, so I'm going to take the common denominator of the two fractions, the numerator. What is the common denominator for those two fractions? x times x plus h. And uh, I'm going to use that expression to clear the fractions of the numerator. That's what I'm going to do in the numerator. Then in order to avoid changing the fraction, I've got to apply that same sequence in the denominator. Uh, so very similar to what we saw in the previous example. Uh, the denominator now is just going to collect those factors. So the h that was already there multiplied by this new factor that I'm about to use to clear fractions. Okay, so what happens here? Uh, now this, uh, this has to be distributed. When I multiply the first term by x times x plus h, what do I end up with? x. So the x plus h is cancel. All I have left over is the x. And from that I'm going to subtract what I get uh, when I multiply here, x plus h. Uh, but the whole quantity Right, subtraction there is the quantity that it remains uh, under that multiplication. And now I can see uh, this is going to, uh, this is taking me exactly where I want it to be. Uh, under the subtraction, x minus x minus h, the important thing here are those two x's. And let me repeat, if at the end of this process uh, you have not eliminated all terms that involve factors of x and something's, uh, factors of h, then something's gone wrong. At the end of this process, 
should be able to cancel away the factor of H in the denominator. And once again, that's exactly what's going to happen here. This minus H on top and the H on the bottom, those two terms can be canceled. So, bomb. And now, and it's not X, it's H. And so, now, no problem. What's the derivative going to be equal to? X, uh, H in place of, uh, 0 in place of H. Second factor, X times X, negative 1 over X squared. Okay, so there's, uh, there we go, uh, three of our fundamental operations. The square power, the square root, the reciprocal form. All of them have explicit derivative forms uh, that come about one way or the other. Uh, and again, there's a pattern here. Um, and we're going to extend this pattern after the test so that we don't have to apply this definition every time we want to take a derivative, right? That's a very complicated, uh, now these are simple examples, these are relatively simple functions. <coughs> but if I try and apply, if I had to do this every single time I wanted a derivative of an arbitrary function, uh, my whole process would come to a grinding halt. Uh, in some cases this is extremely difficult to do. In some cases, it's impossible to do it directly through algebraic means. We have to bring in some other types of geometric concerns. Uh, but uh, for now, make sure you can complete this process for these relatively simple cases. Uh, and now we can do the evaluations. Now this should be pretty simple. Uh, based on this function's derivative, what is f prime of 1? Negative 1. So now this is just a substitution problem. Negative 1 over 1 squared. Uh, what's f prime of negative 2? What's f prime of 0? Undefined. Hmm. Interesting. Why? Because this is the case of division by zero, right? You can't do that. Okay, so this does tell us something about this function. Um, the derivative, uh, it does have a derivative, but it's not defined at a particular point. Okay, so uh, there, there's a derivative process. And, uh, oh, by the way, of course, uh, what does this represent? What does this tell me, right? The fact that f prime of 1 is equal to negative 1, what does that tell me about the graph of this function? What do I know now about the graph of the function 1 over x at the point where x is 1? The slope of the tangent line at that point is negative 1. So on the one hand, this is a simple, out, this is all algebraic. The der a derivation of the derivative, this evaluation, all that can be done completely independently of any notion of the geometric significance of what we're doing. Uh, but we solve the geometric problem now. For this function's graph, the slope of the tangent line at the point where x is 1 has a slope of negative 1. That's the geometric significance of this result. We always keep that in the back of our minds. The derivative is a solution to the tangent problem. So every derivative, every evaluation indicates some property of this function's tangent lines to its graph. Okay.